Hello. You know, so many of us go through life doing one thing and dreaming of doing something else. I'm one of those people. I'm in show business. I'm very fortunate to have that job. But quite frankly, if I'd studied harder, been graded more fairly, I would have been a scientist. Or Albert Brooks was born Albert Lawrence Einstein. His father, Harry Einstein, known as Nick the Greek Chef or Parky Carcass, was a comedian whose fame came with the rise of the first wave of American mass media. Harry had been a Hearst reporter and an ad man who took up comedy as a fun hobby. During the 1920s, as American mass media came into its own, Harry started appearing on WEEI in Boston doing comedy skits while he headed the radio department at a furniture company. His friends, including the band leader Joe Rhines, began encouraging him to do comedy full-time on the radio and quit the advertising business. Finally, Harry took Rhines up on the offer to appear on his radio show as a Greek character. These appearances were so popular that the national radio networks began to take notice. Harry was invited onto the Eddie Cantor show, which was a huge break. If you've ever seen Boardwalk Empire, you can see how popular Eddie Cantor was. I have a dumb that they come, but the better I like them, plus the dumb one, the how to make love. Nick the Greek Chef became a regular feature on Eddie Cantor's show and then on Al Jolson's radio show. This was the mid-1930s, so the jazz singer had already come out, but comedy films were popular around the country. You can brush off a Russian, a Russian won't take Russian. You may brush up Russian, but never brush a Russian. Oh, you pronounce it Russian, you reach the same conclusion. A Russian won't take Russian, so you may do your worst. And Harry's Greek, Nick Parky Carcass character, appeared in a handful. Eventually, this led to Harry's own radio show, Meet Me at Parky's, which debuted in 1945 and ran for three years on NBC. NBC would feature heavily on his son Albert's career as well. On the radio, he was Nick Parky Carcass hapless Greek restaurant owner. From there, Harry worked steadily as a comedian, eventually collapsing and dying of a fatal heart attack during a Friars Club roast of Lucy and Desi Arnaz in 1958. This death traumatized his 11-year-old son, Albert Brooks, who would use comedy as a way to cope with this huge loss. I only go into so much detail about Harry Einstein because I think Albert Brooks' career mirrored his father's. Radio had been this mass media movement giving everyone in America the same news at the same time, and solidifying the networks, including NBC, as household names, crucial to the families across the country. By the 1970s, when Albert Brooks, now no longer Einstein, and his older brother Bob Einstein, who would go on to play Super Dave Osborne and Marty Funkhauser, were getting situated, there was a new mass media format which had boomed from 9% to 90% of families during the 1960s. Television gave Bob Einstein a start writing for the Smothers Brothers and gave Albert Brooks, who was part of the radio comedy team, The Credibility Gap, national prominence when shows like The Tonight Show on NBC had him on as a guest to perform stand-up. Now, ladies and gentlemen, hey, I could have fooled you. You know what I mean? What? To get laughs? I could have fooled you to get laughs, but that's not what it's all about. I'm trying to be honest with you. I'm what? I couldn't resort to cheap tricks? Come on, I can drop my pants as easy as anyone in the business, you know what I mean? What? Pull. Pull. I can get the comedy shorts from Sear. I can stop a makeup man in the hall and say, do me a favor, draw a funny uh, face on my chair. Like Nick, the Greek chef, Albert Brooks created a persona for his act. Narcissistic, egotistical, and nervous, a consummate Hollywood insider. His comedy landed him a role with Scorsese in Taxi Driver and five short mockumentaries that he wrote and directed for SNL. How many times have you gotten nice laughs at a party, had a friend turn to you and say, you know something? That was pretty funny. You should think about being a comedian. Well, your friend was right. Yes, the comedy fraternity of show business is a fast-paced, nutty, funny world. There are always openings for good comedy talent. But you say, I just don't know if I have what it takes to become a professional, Albert. So I say, why not find out? Finally, in 1979, Albert Brooks was ready for the career he'd really be known for. He decided to write and direct his first movie. This movie was real life, a daring and ahead of its time spoof of what would later be called reality TV. He co-wrote real life with Harry Shearer, who had just been hired by SNL, who would go on to be a member of Spinal Tap and half the voices on The Simpsons and Monica Johnson would become his longtime collaborator. Mm, I think you're overreacting. 
I mean, I know what you're saying, but I think it showed you in a very good light. It was very interesting. I appreciate that, but I'm going to have to continue to work here after this film comes out. And I don't know if I owned an animal and I saw me losing that horse whether I would trust me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but I wouldn't worry about it. I mean, you see, people go to doctors for personal reasons, and you gave off something very good in there. I say it's ahead of its time because it parodied the first example of reality TV before we knew that's where TV was actually going to be heading. At the time, it was idiosyncratic and experimental. The TV series, An American Family, was created by Craig Gilbert. Gilbert followed around a typical American family from California, the Loud family, in 1971 for seven months. You take him to lunch and he'll eat four steaks and a couple of chickens, really. No strain, three or four meals at a sitting. Eight or nine salads, and then he doesn't eat for about three or four days. He doesn't sleep. He won't, he'll, he'll go without sleep for uh, for three days. Doesn't sleep. How old is he now? About 95. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's 20. He's 20 years old. 20? Yeah, just the health is just ruined. Completely ruined. Is it? No. He'll never, he'll never make it to 25. Does he have any talents at all? Uh, which would provide a living? Uh, yeah, he's going to end up as a salesman. He's got a personality. That's about all. He's got yeah. An audience has followed along as Bill and Pat Loud, who are on the verge of a divorce already but seem to epitomize the American dream, had their idyllic life fall apart with camera crews following them around. Albert Brooks parodied that TV series in 1979's Real Life, putting himself at the center as the filmmaker character. This is already a meta representation. Albert Brooks makes constant reference to his frequent Tonight Show and Ed Sullivan appearances and his five short documentaries. Here they're actual documentaries, not spoofs, as proof of his resume. He descends upon this nervous family played by Charles Grodin and Francis McCain, and ruins their lives in short order. This version of reality TV parodies the American Family version, treating it as an experiment, working with medical clinical professionals, which already exists as a multi-sided contradiction. As holistic and psychological as you want to be about it, television is a commercial product which sells advertisements on entertainment. The network executive character who doesn't get it, Albert Brooks is the creative force, and the psychological institute are at a constant loggerhead. These are totally different incentives. Had you heard of the Institute before the project began? No. Which of the tests did you enjoy the most? I enjoyed working with the computers. I wouldn't say that I enjoyed any of the testing. <laughs> but Albert Brooks manages to expose questions that would come to plague reality TV decades later. Reality, as portrayed on the television, is always going to be mediated by the cameras. Cinema Verite was already a tenuous concept, going back as far as the 1922 film The Nuke of the North, which proclaimed to show Inuit people in their natural environment. It was really mostly staged by the showman and explorer turned director, Robert Flaherty. Television, of course, is a medium that demands constant entertainment for a mass audience. But the sad truth is that most of the time, real life, as we experience it, is boring and uneventful. If it wasn't, television would probably not be a popular way to spend the time. Reality TV, on the other hand, is rarely boring. And so the question of authenticity, or in wrestler's terms, kayfabe, has always been part of media analysis. Albert Brooks is already grappling with that in real life, as he is the real central chaotic force in the film. Real life was far ahead of its time, and the reviews, which were lackluster at the time, show that. Essentially deconstructing a genre which had only been invented six years ago and was not even mapped out as a genre. Albert Brooks slammed into another fascinating thing, which has plagued reality TV from the beginning. In the six years since it aired, the American Family family had their lives ruined and turned upside down by the press from their reality show. Making a normal family into celebrities for their normality had not been done yet and was damaging psychologically and draining emotionally. Albert Brooks parodied that phenomenon in real time as he and the Jaeger family become the story in the news media. Right. Feels big, huh? Oh, yeah. Feels good? Yeah, yeah. Get out of here. You're, hey, you're, you're trespassing. Get, film. get film on this. Get nothing on this. You're oh, trespassing. Get out of here. You're trespassing. This no, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. This is a news story. No, it's a movie. This is copyrighted. Get out of here. How do you copyright somebody's life? Hold a few bars and figure it out. Get oh, out of here. The second set of cameras tracking a family who are being watched continually by the first set, which adds another layer of mediation. At one point, the news anchor asked the family to stage a breakfast they were already in the process of eating. 
family having breakfast. Uh -huh. And I thought maybe when you're done, if you could get them to put on another quick little breakfast thing for us to film it, it it'd really help us out. I beg all. your pardon. At this point in the 21st century, I think that a basic understanding between TV audiences and the industry has been reached. We don't want the typical American family reflected back at us. We want freaks. We want something special, something different reflected back at us, with the TV pretending that it's reality. And Albert Brooks gives us probably the best freak he knows, himself. Shows like Jersey Shore, or the aptly named The Real World, pretend to do what real-life parodies decades before they even existed. They show us their mismatched cast, plucked from obscurity, sleeping or having sex, or even in quick moments of boredom. But it's a show, and these are characters, and this is all unreality. And, as Albert Brooks learns in real life, that is ultimately for the best. I never thought I'd say this. The studio is right. The audience loves fake. They crave fake. Reality sucks. I can do fake. I'm capable. I just won't get a chance. I won't ever be able to work again. Come on, take it easy. 